Hi, I'm Karen. I'm a founding member of SPRIG, a festival in development that will convene artists, technologists, and communities to exchange ideas and catalyze acts of genius. We hope to have our first physical gathering in Split, Croatia in autumn 2021. In the meantime, we've decided to go ahead and start some conversations here in the virtual world to introduce some inspiring people who are working at the exciting cross-section of art, technology, and community. John Lowenstein is an artist who has spent decades documenting community, his own in Chicago's South Side, as well as communities of migrants from Central America to the U.S. He forges long-term, sometimes multi-generational relationships with his subjects, so his images tell very intimate stories of folks who live in communities whose true stories are often not told. John recently started archiving his work on the blockchain and reaching out to the crypto art community to help raise funds for the completion of The Advocate, his first feature-length documentary. The Advocate tells the story of young Black activists in Chicago's South Side, focusing on Jedediah Brown, who has dedicated his life to fight for justice and peace in his community. The film explores the mental health impact of doing this work in the face of relentless violence and neglect. It also examines how the ability to broadcast their own actions and experiences on Facebook Live has empowered activists and helped them make positive change in ways that had previously not been possible. John is a Guggenheim Fellow, National Geographic Explorer, and TED Fellow. I spoke to him live on October 9th, 2020, and this recorded conversation was edited for clarity. America is the only country I've ever known. It's a whole lot of injustices in this country. But damn it, I was born in America for a reason. And you get two options. Either you're going to complain about it, or you're going to change it. I'm not much for complaining. My name is Jedediah. Y'all know me as an activist. I love my city. And we just want the same thing everybody else wants. Can we figure this shit out? Black death is profitable. That's why the system that we currently live under and its architecture is not designed to get us out of this mess. I just wanted God to be pleased with me. I just wanted the city to get better. And I feel like God has failed me. God has failed us. Let's get into it with John. So, um, John, there's you not have enough been fun. On there's not enough activities. There's not enough role models. The there's not South enough economic for opportunities. Some years now, right? How Man, years there's not been? enough alternatives to buy. Go to the South Side when I'm baby starting to build Callaway. Go there. Go there. Control your own. I went down to the corner uh, leading a protest of about 250 people on like a Tuesday afternoon. And he had these like my body softened my finances sizes on these. We don't know who to trust everybody pair of problems. This is going man. on because there's matter, protests and stuff up. back then, but this was a really interesting George protest, Floyd and so I thought I just revealed um, all the pain that's, that's been going on the dress. And then uh, so, the next time, I think I saw him because I Chicago. I, him in a while, and I love you. I kept on thinking I gotta go in and America. Talk to America. Sometimes uh, you rally. be tripping. The Trump was supposed to come to Chicago at this big rally. <laughs> but I love. They you shut too. it down and Jedediah jumped onto the stage. The activist community came, showed up, filled the whole, like, half the arena with, like, activists and anti Trump protesters. And then Jedediah jumped on the stage and grabbed the mic. And then that was really wild. And then finally, um, in 2017, one of my really close friends happened to be working on a story about him and I was like yeah I've been following that guy a little bit too he's so interesting and so we started talking about doing a story about him and that's when I started to sh photograph him when I when I spent some time photographing him and Lamont and some of the uh, Lamont record who's another young activist um, when I kind of came when I started following them it, I realized that photography wasn't going to do it that uh, to tell their story you really needed to show what their their voices, what they have to say about the world. And it's so powerful and so, in a sense, aspirational um, and positive 
that the photographs I just didn't feel like reflected the whole story. So I, I said to Jed after we finished the article, which was an amazing article and the writing was incredible, but the photographs, I felt like we could do even more with his story. So I said to Jed, do you think we can follow you? And I started following Jedediah and interestingly, shortly thereafter, um, there was a kind of a big protest that he helped lead and, um, that's where the four main characters in the film intersected on the first day of, of that. So it's pretty incredible. So how many years total now you've been actually filming Jedediah and these activists? Yeah, probably almost like four years, but you know, off and on when I, when I have time and doing everything I can to follow them. Yeah. Um, and so you've kind of seen them grow up in a way, right? Yeah. I mean, what's amazing is like, I first saw Lamon record when he was 15 and he was really became world famous essentially and really well known because he would go up to the police officers and put his face literally like two inches from the police and just stare in their face in the aftermath of Laquan McDonald, who was a young man who was um, shot 16 times. And then the video was covered up by the city government, essentially. And William Calloway and other people, lawyers and different folks, worked to get the FOIA and heard that there was a video in the, uh, in the police video, that there was actually a police video, and worked to get a FOIA and get that released. And that led to these massive protests, which frankly helped uh, bring down some of the most powerful people in Chicago, including in many ways, I would say Rahm Emanuel, who was the mayor. So the work and the actions that these young people, which I think are part of what's called a leaderful, what a lot of people are referring to as a leaderful movement is fascinating because there's not one there's not one activist who, you know, it's not like a MLK and they, you know, of course that, that movement had so many people involved, but I'm just saying there wasn't one person you can point to. There's all different people all over the country working for change for many years. And this is part of a movement that's gone on for since the civil rights movement, essentially over and over again. And so this film really explores kind of the work it takes to go out and actually put yourself in that position, some of the personal costs, and in a, a sense, um, the evolution, the personal evolution of some of the characters who started in one place, uh, philosophically, I think, and are going to probably end up in another. And why is you know, the, these movements, the civil rights movement has been going on forever. And we've had, um, you know, George Floyd was a flashpoint recently. But why does yeah. this story in particular that you've been filming for so many years before this moment, why does this need to be told now? Why are you cutting it off here? Uh, it, 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 it's, it's vital that people, I think right now, people are seeing sort of these actions. And now they're seeing a lot of like, the rioting and it's being almost twisted against in many ways uh, it's being twisted and used against the original point. So understanding the people and what it's actually behind it, I think is vital right now. I think it's really important to humanize from the point of view and really be inside the movement. A lot of films uh, about these issues focus on, let's say, like um, like 16 Shots is an amazing film, but it really focused particularly on the actual explaining the Laquan McDonald event. But this one is less about the events and sort of one event and more about just the day-to-day -day life of showing up again and again. And I think what's amazing about following people over many years is that so, sometimes it takes that long for someone to understand, for a subject to understand what you're actually trying to accomplish. So Alita Clark, 
whose nickname is Englewood Barbie, was, you know, I've, I've, I've been filming her off and on in the context of the protests and in different spaces that I go to. And I've always said, hey, can I, you know, I find this, she's a great character because she's a woman. She helps feed the homeless. She's been homeless herself. She's just a fighter, but she's also an incredibly um, strong and, and cool personality. But she just didn't understand what I was doing. Even when I explained to her, I'd be like, I'm doing this film. But the other day, you know, when I talked to her and I was shooting, she was like, she understood and I explained to her exactly what I'm doing. And now she could see it. And she was like, great. I want to be a part of that. And that took, you know, three, four years of just showing up on my part too. And so like she shows up for the homeless people at 51st and Wentworth and has created a club called Club 51, which is basically just feeding homeless people each night under a viaduct, you know, on the far south side of Chicago, one of the most abandoned places in America. And, you know, just show, that she shows up every night and then I continue to show up over time, builds that trust. And I think that's what it takes to get to see behind the scenes sometimes. And that's why I've continued to, in many ways, go to similar subjects with similar people, you know, in the same kind of veins. In a way, it's like it's long documentary journalism or documentary work. And I, I think that's sometimes what it takes. And it's amazing how, you know, right now in America, we're like at this point where people are incredibly under a lot of pressure. In, in the communities that I cover, which are really forgotten communities, systematically denied so many resources and opportunities, there's just an, inc I think there's just sort of a frustration there that it's like people are really trying, but they're coming up against this, this real level of hate and indifference and systematic oppression that's been there for a long time, but now it's so overt. And, and that's really painful. And so there's a lot on top of COVID, on top of all the other things. So this is really a flashpoint right now before the election. And I do believe that this film will be relevant next year when it comes out. But the time put in is going to make it helpful because you're really going to be inside this, this movement. I'm just, you know, a few people. It's really... Their stories are like, there's people like this in every, you know, community who are fighting. One thing that I re noticed from watching the various segments that you've shown me so far is that there's a lot of, you know, when I think of activists, I think of the, you know, standing on the front lines and shouting, marching down the street and, and yeah. confrontation with the cops. But it's not always like that. It's like there's a lot of sitting around. Uh, looking for food, eating pizza, like waiting to talk to the person you're there to petition. Um, and you've told me stories about um, just, you know, if, if one household experiences a trauma and they don't have access to the sorts of social services that we take for granted, then people gather around and, you know, do everything they can to help someone out of that situation. And so a lot of it is just everybody within that community that has been ignored, just doing whatever they can to help each other. And those are the people that you're covering, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the actual direct action confrontation with police is, and you know, with police accountability, which Jedediah really has spent a lot of his time. That's kind of what his energy has been put into is police accountability, fighting for police accountability. And, yeah, the time of like, I would say the fighting and protesting, that's a small percentage of the time of what it actually takes to get, to make any change. Um, and so, yes, like showing up to bail people out, showing up to family members, like this one kid who was um, bullied at school and had taken his tried to take his life and ended up in the emergency room showing up for that mom when nobody's showing up and nobody paying her attention. And she's gone time and again to the school, the principal, and then the 
Chicago Public Schools main area complaining, saying my child is being bullied. So when the kid finally got, uh, anyway, long story short, showing up to help that family. And that's, I think, what's really wild. Like yesterday, I was at Club 51 last night. And I think building those relationships for, for the activists is also about showing up. Because the community has to trust you, right? It's not like whoever you are, it's, there's a, you know, always ways you can exploit people in many situations. And certainly when things are really desperate, there's all kinds of ways that people ex are exploited. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of trust. So that trust is built by the activists also. And so like when I went to Club 51 last night, you know, uh, Alita feels like her role isn't just giving food. Food is a way in, in a way to open conversations about helping in many other ways, whether she, as she has said, it's like, whether it's finding housing for somebody if they want it, whether it's burying someone who's died, whether it's, you know, helping with finding it, maybe a drug addiction facility or what have you. Uh, counseling like a lady came the other day to the safe house that she founded and was asking can you help me with counseling so the thing that i've been impressed with is they're they're called on to do so many things people are in such need that people coming up all the time with different requests like i was fired for my job i think it was for this reason can you help me i've seen that with jed you know, family members who don't have the money to bury someone who's been murdered. The levels of violence in our community are are so high that people are getting, it's not just police violence, it's interpersonal social violence that goes on. And that has so many ramifications in terms of mental health, in terms of just burying someone when you're really poor, it can be really hard. So a lot of this and also a lot of the, the film that you're making is about the mental health of the young people who have devoted their lives to taking care of their community in this way. And um, can you speak to that? I know that there was an episode with, uh, with Jed where he um, got to the point where he felt like he wanted to commit suicide. And, and you've told me that they've um, devoted their lives to such an extent that there isn't, they don't do anything else because this is such a full-time job. Yeah, so I think with Jed, you know, when he had a personal trauma, like all of us, when we have a personal loss, he lost, um, he helped raise his cousin's son and he considered him his son. And when that happened, his son basically drowned in Lake Michigan. And it wasn't clear at the time whether it was a uh, suicide or a a drowning looks like it was a suicide, but whatever he drowned and that trauma comes on the heels and of years of dealing with kind of a cycle of unending violence and showing up for people in violent situations. So when that happened, he kind of turned the, in a sense, almost turned the gun on himself and he brought, he, his cry for help was on Facebook Live, I would say. And he went on Facebook Live, drove his car onto the shores of Lake Michigan. And luckily, the police intervened, and they didn't shoot him. They knew him. And, you know, it, it worked out okay. And for him, I think the rebuilding is, is one thing that I've seen him grow in this from that moment, which in a sense, I felt like, and I think was his lowest moment in many ways, uh, where you almost end your life, uh, rebuilding to something where he is actually contributing so much to society. I always think like all this violence and gun violence of young people in so many ways, whether it's suicide or social violence, police violence, whatever it is that we're not really creating a healthy enough communities that this exists. Mm -hmm. Um, is is such an important thing to highlight that look what we could have lost. Here's this voice that is so powerful and unique 
and this human being who's and everybody's unique. And it's like, we, we almost lost that because, you know, just so much, all this stuff that we're creating and this is happening every day. We're losing. I always, it's, it's a kind of, it's so heartbreaking because I know a lot of, I, I taught school in, in the community. I know a lot. Of, I mean, kids are people I know literally I follow a group of young people and they're losing their friends all the time today, even today. And they've been losing their brothers and cousins and nephews and uncles all the time. And it's just something like, how do we kind of stop that violence? I mean, and really the film, the original film that I started what was really to ask that question of how do we kind of intervene and why, where do, where do they come from in that, in their mindset? But when I followed, um, you know, some of the former gang members, I found it a little too, I couldn't find the, enough light and Jedediah and Alita and them were dealing with a lot of the same forces, but brought a real aspirational and light into it so people could understand. And I think that's what's so important is to understand that everybody wants something. Everybody wants a healthy community, one where you can go to school and, you know, sit, walk safely in your neighborhood and go shopping somewhere and get some decent food at the supermarket. These are like the basics. And we don't have those in a lot of the neighborhoods in American cities and frankly, in rural areas either. A lot of rural areas are dealing with a lot of levels of poverty too. And, but in the cities, this is a lot of American cities. This is what we're dealing with now. And it's, it's not acceptable. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about um, the technology that the activists that you followed use? You, you said one of the things about um, your documentary that's so stylistically unusual is that quite often Jed and his, and his cohorts are filming themselves on their own phones and you're including that footage. And that makes for a really raw sort of, uh, you know, definitely inside, inside the action sort of feel. How did that happen? And did, was that happening before you started filming? And how did you get them also to give, give you the footage and use that in the documentary? Well, you know, it's, it's fascinating because actually, um, I believe one of the characters has taken all his footage down. We didn't download that footage. I, we downloaded the footage from Jedediah's and some of the other people's. Just download it off the internet. You can do that. Um, that's how we did it. Um, but... Jedediah really sees the um, he sees the Facebook live in a sense as an archive of his life from his point of view and telling the story from their point of view is really important that they are controlling the narrative because the narrative they're these young people are highly aware. I mean, they're not that young anymore. Like, Jedediah is like 34 or something. But, um, you know, Lamont's in his tw early 20s at this point, I think, or 20. Um, so anyways, anywhere from 20 to 35, 34. Um, they see that they're controlling the narrative. It's really critical because they feel that mass media is not telling the story that they believe should be told. And so if you see, and they're speaking directly to an audience that frankly has turned mass media off, a lot of mass media off, like, you know, we'll chime in and tune in with Jedediah's live feed much more often. So during the case, the Kanika Jenkins case, where they were in Rosemont, Illinois, which is right next to Chicago, right next to O'Hare Airport, fighting for this young woman who was found in a freezer and her mother had gone to the hotel and said, my, my daughter is missing. She was at the hotel and they said, no, no, call the police. We're, you know, and they didn't look for her 36 hours later. They found her and she was frozen dead in one of their walk-in freezers. 
when they went to her, it was like it became a way to understand that story because the news would show up and they would film some things. You know, they covered the story from this like distance. But Jedediah was right there the whole time talking to people and interviewing. And there was a whole bunch of live streamers. And, you know, it's really fascinating. So, But Jed, I feel like Jed has a little bit more of a sense of building his archive in case something happens to him. Of So Facebook Live. Building his case, archive in case something at some happens point to him. He were to die or get killed. So Facebook Live he, in case... They really have a sense that life is pretty or get killed. ephemeral in the sense that they, they really have a sense that life is pretty other ephemeral people in the community. In the um, anyway, long story short, he's, he's in an archive. For instance, the other day he went to work and someone tried to shoot him. So uh, he does uh, consider that this is an archive of his life, in a sense, told from his point of view about mm -hmm. his own life. And so it is actually, I think, an extra level of um, the screen and uh, social media. It's extremely, the, the material is not an archive. And anytime they can take it down or YouTube or Facebook can take it down. Mm -hmm. It's extremely ephemeral. Mm -hmm. It is totally not at all an archive of our time. And that is becoming more apparent because I believe one of the characters... Uh, erased his entire material from the last five years, four years, five years, and it's gone. It's not out there for history. Mm -hmm. So I actually think this is this this group of activists and this moment we're not actually like in the. We have this amazing amount of material of what this moment was, and what it is, and what led up to George Floyd. And and thereafter, and Trump and all this stuff, and we're you know, like unless we archive that, someone archives it, this stuff will just go away. Facebook is going to turn it off, or Facebook's going to you know go away, or change their algorithm, and or someone just says, I don't want this stuff out there anymore, and poof, their yeah. whole story is just like gone, vanishes, mm -hmm. and it's not in some news archive it's nothing it's just gone so it's really i feel like that is becoming when that happened the other day i was like wow this is like actually really fascinating did it but having the tools to tell their own story in the moment of protests does that change the way they um approached it and did it change the outcome of their protests oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's changed everything Totally changed. I mean, Laquan McDonald, all that stuff, the amount of people who showed up, that, that was all done on social media. There is, you know, I've followed this story long enough. It's really interesting because I'm working on a book about the South Side and I shot most of it from 2003, 4 till 2012 and then or 2014. And there were definitely social movements from two, until 2010. 2000, 2010, there were definitely people protesting in the community. There were a lot, I mean, I went to a lot of like anti-violence protests and there were obviously there were huge migrant protests, but in the black community, there was a lot of protests. They generally remained in the community. They were covered by local news. Often, honestly, there would be no coverage or there'd be minimal coverage I went to a fair amount of protests that were like in the anti-violence protests that were in the community that were community driven that nobody knew about mm -hmm. um, that never went beyond the South side or the West side. Um, maybe they would get on like a WGN with social media. The young people figured out that this was a way to communicate outside with each other. Mm -hmm. and to the outside world and to their direct audience in the community and the community beyond. And um, it totally changed. Yes, it changed history. Does that also, mean more people, did it galvanize more people so that people, more people ended up on the street with them? Or 
yes. financial support yes. or what? What did that mean? Yes, all of it. They go, they, they, they yeah, getting more people on the street, financial support because they can, uh, like in these guys raise money through that, that helps them do the work. Mm -hmm. Um, and then just getting the word out, like making like almost like their own direct news stations. You know what I mean? And there's so much personality. That's the thing. Like all these guys, all the people in the film have so much personality and they kind of, part of the film is about creating their own like kind of identities, right? It's finding yourself in that, uh, in that space because, you know, like they don't all really get along. They don't all necessarily like each other. Um, but, and they don't all, and they have, frankly, the people in the film have pretty different points of view on how to make change. And, uh, but that doesn't really matter. You know, they're fighting, doing things and fighting to find their own, their own themselves really. Mm -hmm. I mean, one thing that for the young men, especially, but also for women, I believe, the, there just aren't that many ways to be successful in the community. There's a lot of, there's a lot of ways to go wrong as you grow up. You know, there's a lot of ways for a lot of young men in, who grew up on the South and West sides, you know, there's a lot of ways that if you take one wrong move, you could end up um, dead in a gang, you know, in jail, and, you know, that can happen in a lot, a lot of ways. Beyond that, just the resource, the schools, the lack of resources just leads to a lot of, frankly, economic social deprivation, which is super hard. So these guys are dealing directly with that. They dealt with it growing up. And now they're, I think that empathy from actually dealing with that helps them do the work that they do. Mm -hmm because they kind of, it's not just sympathy. It's like when Alita was talking to this young man who was in the military and was homeless and sleeping under a viaduct last night, she said, look, I've been homeless. I've slept in my car because I had pride. I didn't want to ask anyone else, but I was still out here helping, but I couldn't help myself. So you, she was like, there's, we can help we can get you a place to live if you want it. Mm -hmm. If that's what you want to do. Like, but you have to decide that for yourself. The young man had been in the military and he, he had a lot of PTSD. He was a super cool guy, but he was telling me his just a, t a touch of his story. It was kind of really wild. So um, that's the thing. I think, you know, Jedediah, Lamont, each one of these guys has had different experiences in in growing up and understand the community in a different way so i think that's super powerful so that we should look at some of the art i think um and we can talk Wait. about also how we've um how you made your debut in the crypto art community um yeah the film and you started a gofundme to raise funds to help get it done um and I, because I'm in the crypto art community, I suggested to you, hey, why don't you mint some of your yeah. photographs and then so you cool. go to work, which we could talk about, um, but also maybe create a, an adjunct way for people to contribute and maybe the crypto art community could help contribute. So um, maybe we, maybe this is a good time for us to cut to crypto voxels really quickly. I don't know if um, I can, you or I can narrate the crypto voxels gallery. Um, sure. Um, so the story is I approached Known Origin, which is a, a lovely crypto art platform. And David Moore, uh, who I think is watching this, um, agreed to partner with us and support John and uh, the, the funding of The Advocate. And so I minted John's works uh, on his behalf in Known Origin. And David also created a gallery in Known Origin's crypto voxel space dedicated to the advocate. So the full set of the images is there and up for anybody who wants to collect the tokens and the proceeds will go towards funding the film. Um, okay. John, do you want to talk a little bit about um, 
the experience of getting onboarded to Known Origin and the crypto art? Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, it's been amazing. Like, well, on August 20, you know, getting the, the, um, getting the images up, that was really done through your help, Karen. And that wasn't so bad for me, but it was a lot of work for you. So thank you. And thanks to Known Origin for putting the work up. I love that it's just breaching, you know, other borders of community. And you had, when uh, George Floyd happened and everything, you were like, there's been a fair amount of like tension in the community and we want, people really want to connect, but they don't know how. So I was, we started talking to you said, why don't you put your work up? And so it's really created this conversation in a space that I think is a good space to have it in such a different world. So when we did the march on August 28th, which was this virtual march, because I couldn't be in D.C., we had like, I don't know, 50 people like marching with us in, in the crypto land. And I was like, that's so cool. Because, you know, one of the things that I've been realizing about hate and about indifference and intolerance is like the, you know, the, those borders are really drawn not just in lo not just in person anymore they're drawn in this virtual space in algorithms and in uh, the way people share these memes and it's online and facebook live and how people are building their own news things and so it's really important that we that we'd reach out to different communities with this work. And so I appreciate that we did that here and it's a really cool experiment. Um, and I also think from an archiving perspective, it's kind of fascinating because blockchain is harder to erase and it has a sort of collective aspect to it that I really respect. Do you think you'll be archiving more of your work on the blockchain after after the fundraising for the advocate is over? I hope so. Uh, I hope to archive like work from my Southside book. I think that would be really cool. Uh, but you know, right now I've got my hands are so full trying to get this film just finished. It's a lot of work to really see it all the way through and. One of the things that I had um, in the past when I have done these types of projects, I kind of hit a roadblock on the editing component. But now I have an amazing editor named Rachel Webster who's doing a great job and I'm building a team. Karen's on board uh, and a whole bunch of other people who are um, not a whole bunch, but a few other really amazing people who believe in the story and we're going to see it through to, to its wonderful end and get it out because it's a really, uh, it's a really kind of heart warming, but also important story that people see what these young folks are capable of and are, are actually doing for our democracy in the United States and to fight indifference and intolerance that's coming directly from very powerful forces. And it's so damaging because the language and rhetoric that we use with in political arenas ends up playing out in everyday life at the local Walmart, in local communities, in how we see each other. And then it's just kind of heartbreaking what can be done when someone is so when we have so much negativity you know and positivity breeds positivity but negativity breeds it like 10 times more you know it it's just so we have to fight really hard so that's why the advocate i believe can be a, just a good way to understand a little bit more about what's happening Definitely. It, should we maybe run the Channel 4 segment that you did on Jedediah? You made a short segment for Channel 4. 
and it'll sure. give us another look into the film and then maybe uh, we can come back and see if there are any questions and then call it a call it a day. I can set that up a little bit because uh, basically like we used, we followed Jed for a couple of days right after George Floyd. Uh -huh. And he came back to the neighborhood where I first met him. And it was about, it was the, you know, right after the, the, the unrest from George Floyd had hit Chicago and the neighborhood, like people were really wanting to burn the neighborhood down. Like, we, they had already burned some, some buildings had been burned, but people wanted to take it another level forward. And he and Will met right, right next to the corner, almost like two blocks from the corner where I met him. And they talked these young people off the ledge and really turned them from a point of negativity into a point of positivity in that moment saying, look, you guys can do something. It's in your hands, but don't burn your neighborhood. And, mm -hmm. you know, don't damage your neighborhood mm -hmm. because that's not what we need. And that was the thing that was so heartbreaking in Chicago about the bridges being put up and the idea that certain areas are supposed to be protected, but they didn't put any police or protect any of the pharmacies or the supermarkets or anything like that. It was like, okay, just, you know, in the, in the South and West side, it was just like, once the looters start going there, hey, just let him loot. You know, it wasn't like, hey, let's let's protect some strategic spaces like they did downtown mm -hmm. in some areas. But really, honestly, that, that looting and stuff went kind of around the city for a minute. America is the only country I've ever known. It's a whole lot of injustices in this country. But damn it, I was born in America for a reason. And you get two options. Either you're going to complain about it or you're going to change it. I'm not much for complaining. No justice, no peace. No racist police. No justice, no peace. No racist police. No justice, no peace. No racist police. No 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 What's good, y'all? How y'all doing? This is Jedi Dyer. So my mind is full. My heart is heavy. My day started with protest. I got no weapons. I'm going to stay right here. My name is Jedediah. Y'all know me as an activist. I love my city. I love my city. I actually like first responders who actually, when they're called, come and help my community out. And we just want the same thing everybody else wants. We want to be able to walk around our neighborhood, feel safe, go to work, raise our kids, get an education. I saw way more people go to jail than they need to. Rules without relationship breeds rebellion. Can we figure this shit out? Malik Gresham, too many. Sherelle Brown, too many. George Floyd revealed all the pain that's been going unaddressed in this city. It's bigger than just this one cop. It's about the systematic racism and oppression that made that cop possible. And people in Chicago expressed themselves how much people did not feel ownership in their communities. That's the only reason a person to destroy their own community, is that they don't feel like they own it or that they have a part in building it. You can just feel how tired our people are. I see way more police coming in riot gear. George Floyd don't deserve this. We don't need all these cops. We don't need no billy club. Y'all done enough. You've done enough. Oh, shit. Yo! Take this. Take it. Take no. Stay right there. Right now, one of the gentlemen who is working for me is in jail. I may be sitting out here until 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm afraid that when I get this man and I start driving, 
that I might be stopped for curfew. And I might even try to comply. I could get beat up, tased, maced, or shot. If I don't got a camera, then whatever the narrative they say, that's what it's going to be. And that's what it feel like being black in America. You have the benefit of being blue and black. Black and blue, however you want to hit it. But when I take this uniform off, you black. You I, gotta, look. I have to go back home to the south side of but Chicago. I'm saying, with, with that being and I'm said, dealing with the same things that you're dealing with. I got to deal with all this mayhem that's being inflicted know. by our people. You know, how we get the message across that we tired of being murdered. You can be streets. tired, but you don't destroy your own community. I've been 11 years, you know how many times I came to this it's building right and though. protested and kneeled and prayed and, and, and held my hands up? Protesting. 11 no years. Years. 11 years. 11 years. 11 years. Rioting and vandalism is not the answer. Martin Luther King said that rioting is the language of the unheard. But what I'm saying is, I hear you, right. and I pray to God you hear us. We're not rioting or looting. But even when we went out to try to keep things under control, he went to jail. He got jumped because he didn't have your best. I need Will Callaway. I need Jim Knight. I need Jay Maul. I need Come on, Jay. We got a long road ahead of us. Victory is not here yet. But victory is coming because it's very clear that the consciousness of America is rising. Hey, how you guys doing? Have a good night. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know change won't come. Oh, yes, it will. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. Point being, that moment, that moment was very, it, it was, it was important that Jed and Will and some other people really stop. Just that's like an important, it's an, it, it's an important moment to, that could have gone. It just shows that when you, even if you don't, he didn't know everybody in the neighborhood, but Will knew a lot of the people. And that's really Will's like space. And so when Will and Jed together, but it was like, you could see he could speak. Jed really spoke strongly to the people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, things like that are just, he has a way, I think Jed does have a way, a uh, powerful way of, when things are kind of starting to go bad, of just centering, speaking this in this clear voice and sort of like turning, he's able to lead in that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, Things like that are just, he has a way, I think Jed does have a way, a uh, powerful way of when things are kind of starting to go bad, of just centering, speaking this in this clear voice and sort of like turning, he's able to lead in that way. Mm -hmm. And he, I saw a real incredibly, change. Incredibly charismatic. He's very charismatic. And um, yeah. I also found out through you that he also works as, he, he's a preacher, so he, tries to bring upliftment to people and you know yeah he used he used to be a preacher and now he's, he he, he kind of went yeah he used to be a preacher but he I don't think that was his calling so he he's on a different path and I don't know part of the film is about that path but it's pretty wild um, I guess I should also say that um, Mokta is working on an exhibition of your yeah. work and I think we're going to try to show in that exhibition um, a new cut as Rachel is editing it. So there's that to look forward to. And hopefully that will also help raise awareness and some funds for completing the film. Yeah. Uh, so just stay tuned for that and we'll announce it at some point, sometime, sometime in October, I think. And also you're Great. working... And you're also working on a book, the Southside book, which is um, photo documentary, uh, photo documentary about this community as a whole, not just focused on the activists, right? Yes. Yeah, it's much more about kind of like just a poetic look at the conditions and just people I know and some of the oral histories and in many ways a little more about 
way what the South Side was is like, in from my point of view, or just it's just beautiful pictures made on Polaroid. It's very it's artistic. Heartfelt. It's very yeah. artistic, actually. It's uh, it's a, as yeah, much of art as it is a, a a documentary um, portrait of this area, and also includes yeah. some of John's own personal writings and poems. So. Yeah. There's that to look forward to, <laughs> probably, hopefully, in the next couple of months. Oh, yeah, that's coming out in uh, January or February. Uh, we're, we're slated to print uh, December, January. So that's coming together. It's looking beautiful. Uh, and that's going to take a little time. But what's really nice about the combination between the book and the film is I think the book really gives you a sense of just kind of the space that people are coming out of and what's been left behind after the factories were torn down and but it's very, in a way, kind of the way it just sort of, it's not about changing it. It's about, and the the film really, I reached a point where I was tired of just documenting sort of a space that was, that was slowly kind of, in many ways, de decaying, I guess, or slowly like going down. And I saw all these young people who are really actively changing and actively fighting. So I, I love that inter they came out of the space and they're just such beautiful people that I felt like we have to make a film about this. Great, okay, I think we're gonna wrap up. And um, thank you, John. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> and thank I guess you so much. it's a wrap. <laughs> thank you very much. I hope people can hear it. Bye.